For a simple constant cross-section area rod that is fixed at one end and subjected to a torque T at the other end, we previously saw that we can think of it as the geometry that is formed when piling discs against each other. By doing this, we see that the disc at the wall is not rotating, the disc at the free end is the disc that has rotated the most, and the disc somewhere in between is rotating an amount that is between zero and the maximum rotation. If the material is homogeneous, and like I said before, the cross-section is constant, and most importantly, we know that the rod is being deformed within the elastic region of the material, each disc would be rotating the same amount with respect to its two adjacent discs. The rotation between disc 1 and 2 is the same as the rotation between 14 and 15, for example. This means that there is linearity to the rotation deformation. If the free end has rotated 30 degrees, then one half of the way from the wall, the rotation would be 15 degrees, and at one third from the wall, one third of that at 10 degrees. We can see how point H, that was originally on the right side of the center of the rod, would have translated along the surface of the rod due to the rotation of that disc. By looking at the side view of the rod, we can see how the elements on the surface of the rod have deformed. They will have translated upward, but they will have also deformed under shear. From the shearing strain main video, link below, you might remember that the shearing stress is equal to the shearing modulus or modulus of rigidity times the shearing strain gamma. Since the arc of the translation of H can be calculated as the radius of the rod times the angle of rotation on that plane, or the angle of twist phi, just as it can be calculated as the length times the angular strain gamma, the angle of twist is equal to L gamma over R. And since gamma is equal to the shearing stress over G, and that stress is the maximum stress expression for torsion, since H is at the surface, C and R, which are the same valuable for the radius of the rod, cancel out, and the angle of twist is therefore equal to TL over JG. This is the expression we will use to calculate the angle of twist in each section of a solid or a hollow cylinder. Now, for this derivation, you can already notice that the length L refers to the length from one point with respect to the other, but more on that in just a second. If we have two external torques, T1 and T2, applied at two distinct locations of a rod fixed at one end, we can find the angle of twist of B with respect to A, for example. We would label this as phi sub AB, from A to B which means that A is the reference and phi AB is telling us the angle of twist at B. To calculate that, we would need the internal torque between A and B, but because we want B with respect to A, we either need TAB or no TBA and add a negative value. To find this, we would need to perform a cut between A and B. If we perform a cut from C to somewhere between A and B so that we don't need to find the reaction torque at the wall A and only use the external torques, we would be finding TBA because that is the torque from B to A. Now notice that even though it's pretty obvious that the internal torque BA should be oriented clockwise, we should always draw unknown internal torques as counterclockwise and therefore positive torques. If when solving for the number value of the internal torque we get a positive value, we have indeed found a counterclockwise internal torque. If the number value turns out to be negative, we know that the orientation should have been clockwise and that the torque is indeed a negative torque. This way, we maintain the very generalized convention everywhere that, most importantly, follows the right-hand rule, where counterclockwise is positive and clockwise is negative. And of course, remember that a proper reference axis should always be referenced in your drawing. The reason to always assume positive internal torques is because it's not always obviously clear that the internal torque is either positive or negative, like it is in this example. So for consistency, always assume positive, and the sign that you get when solving for its value will tell you if the torque, and of course, most importantly, the angle of twist is clockwise or counterclockwise. This is not only consistent with the right-hand rule and the global convention for the orientation of torques and moments, but also consistent with the general procedure of unknown internal axial loads that we studied in a previous video. The link to the specific section of that video where we discuss axial load subindices will be linked in the description of this one.
The only difference with axial loads is that by assuming that all internal axial loads are tensile, a cut from one side will have a vector with an opposite direction than a cut from the other side. For example, in this axial loading case, the unknown internal axial load FBA should be tensile and so should internal axial load FAB. However, FBA is pointing right and FAB is pointing left. Works out pretty well for action-reaction and to calculate axial deformations, FAB and FBA are interchangeable because their magnitude is the same and their orientation is given by the vector drawing. Delta BA and delta AB are expected to have the same sign. Section AB is either being stretched or compressed regardless of the point of reference. In the case of internal torques, the assumption is that they are always positive. There is no tensile or compressive notion, so this means that both TAB and TBA are going to be assumed positive. Of course, their final number value will have a negative sign for one of the two. If we solve for TBA, which is from B to A, meaning we begin at C and perform a cut between B and A, we find that TBA is equal to minus T1 and T2 added together. If we perform the cut from A to B, it means we started at the wall and we would therefore need to know what the reaction torque at A is. To do this, we follow the same procedure we followed for axial loading. We take a free body diagram of the entire rod and solve for TA, the reaction at the wall. And again, we assume TA to be positive since it's also an unknown torque. Solving for TA and going back to the cut between A and B, we can find TAB in terms of TA, which we now know it's minus T1 plus T2, which shows us that TAB is positive and therefore a counterclockwise torque equal to T1 plus T2. As you can see, TBA and TAB have the same magnitude and just like I was previously stating, one of them is positive and the other one is negative. The positive one indicates that TAB is in fact counterclockwise and the negative value of TBA indicates it's clockwise. So if we want to calculate the angle of twist at B, we really want to calculate the angle of twist of B with respect to something that is not moving, in this case, wall A. We write this as phi AB from A to B, or what is the same, B with respect to A, and we would use TAB correspondingly. Since TAB is a positive torque, phi AB is a positive angle of twist. This means that B is rotating counterclockwise. Notice that calculating phi BA, which is the angle of twist from B to A, or the angle of twist of A, would not require to find a reaction torque at A. So it's slightly faster to find TBA with a cut from C and use TBA in the phi BA expression to find that angle. The negative value for phi BA means that A is rotating in a clockwise direction, but only with respect to B, which is true. In a frame of reference where B isn't rotating, then A is rotating clockwise. But since A is the wall and can't rotate, we know that B is the only one rotating in the opposite direction. So even if we're looking for phi B, we can use phi B A to find phi A, and since A is really not rotating, phi B would be the negative of phi A, which is consistent with what we found before. Finally, let's focus on the length variable now. If we want to find phi C, which is phi of C with respect to the wall A, it will be equal to the angle of twist of C with respect to B, plus that of B with respect to A. This process is almost identical to the sub-indices that we used for axial deformation. Link to that video is down below. We can write phi in terms of the expression we just developed, and we can see that the torque from B to C is also minus TCB. With the first cut, we can find TCB from C to B, and assuming a positive value for it, like we always should do, we find that TCB is minus T1. This also means that TBC, the one we actually needed, is just positive T1. From before, and having performed the exact same process, the torque from B to A is negative T1 plus T2. If the radius is the same for both sections, the polar second moment of area J will be the same, and if the rod is made out of the same material, the shearing modulus values will also be the same. 
The last important concept to point out here is that the lengths refer to the distance between the points of reference. LBC is the length from B to C and LAB is the length from A to B. And pay close attention, LAB is not the length from the free end to somewhere between A and B. We only use that cut from C to somewhere between A and B to find the internal torque, but that doesn't mean that the length corresponding to LAB is the length from C to that location. LBC is L1 and LAB is L2. All of these concepts are essential for finding angles of twist and therefore they are essential for solving statically indeterminate problems. Just like with axial loading, statically indeterminate torsion problems are those where unknown torques and therefore torsional shearing stresses cannot be found from static analyses alone. So we use deformation information, in this case angles of twist, to find those torques required to calculate torsional shearing stresses. For statically indeterminate torsion examples, please check the links in the description of this video. Let's put all of these concepts together in a simple example. The aluminum rod BC is bonded to the brass rod AB. If both rods are solid and have a diameter of 12 millimeters, what is the angle of twist at C? Remember to pause here for a second and try this problem on your own before watching the solution. If A is the wall, A is not rotating. So it makes sense to find phi C as phi AC. Phi AC is equal to phi AB plus phi BC. For this, we need TAB and TBC. A cut from C to B will give us TCB, which remember, we assume to be positive. We solve for TCB and the negative of that will give us what we're looking for, TBC. A cut from C to somewhere between A and B will allow us to find TBA, again assumed to be positive, and we use TBA to find TAB, which is what we need. Substituting the lengths, calculating and substituting the polar second moment of area J with the diameter information, and substituting the shear moduli, we find that phi C is equal to positive 0.8187 radians, which with a simple conversion is positive 46.9 degrees. This positive and counterclockwise rotation means that C rotated in the same direction as the counterclockwise external torque, which makes sense. For more complex examples that require the use of angles of twist, including statically indeterminate torsion problems, as well as the links to the videos of other mechanics of materials topics, make sure to check out the description below. Thanks for watching.